disease and a death in Uganda, where it's typically found. And that was identified more or less by accident in 1959, when some monkeys were shipped to Marburg, Germany, and also Belgrade, Yugoslavia, then Yugoslavia, for use in um, laboratories. And uh, not only did the monkeys die, but several laboratory workers uh, came down with infection. And it's a, a very serious infection. And that was the first member of this family, but we didn't know it at the time. And then Ebola uh, came along, was identified, I'll come back to that, in two almost simultaneous outbreaks in 1976. And um, one of the um, directors of a, of the director, actually Fred Murphy, then director of the National Center for Infectious Diseases at CDC, a very interesting electron microscopy, decided to take um, a, a picture of some infected material during that 1976 Ebola outbreak and came up with that with a picture that looks very much like this. This has been somewhat doctored up and keeping with the uh, you know, more graphically intensive times we live in. Um, it's black and white, of course, in, in the original and not, not quite as um, striking. But it was very obvious that at that point he was dealing with a, a new virus. And uh, it also makes a nice, um, sort of looks like a string tie, um, you know, magnified, you know, like those string ties that we wear in uh, New Mexico. I've never actually uh, thought of um, wearing it that way, but you can actually buy, there's a company that actually makes ties with things like pictures of Ebola. Uh, I have a couple at home, but I decided not to wear it today. <laughs> you know, um, uh, not that there's any danger of transmission, but just, you know, uh, we, we obviously don't, don't want to remind people of something already reminded of many, many times a day. So this is from the bottom up, actually, uh, courtesy of Médecins Sans Frontières, of Doctors Without Borders. Uh, this is a chronology of all of the previous Ebola uh, virus outbreaks. And as I mentioned, the very first ones were 1976 uh, in two almost simultaneous outbreaks. And the interesting thing is the one is what was then called Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, was with the strain that we now think of as kind of the, the classic Ebola strain. In fact, uh, when we talk about Ebola officially in the classification system, that was just recently changed. This is synonymous with Ebola. So when we talk about Ebola, almost all of us older people talk about the Zaire strain, or species as we now call it, the Sudan and so on. But actually, um, only if it's not Zaire do you need to specify, uh, which is so confusing that we, we have not been able to adopt that habit. Uh, but this was the one that you know, we most uh, classically think of as Ebola. And that, in fact, has been the most frequent. Uh, it, uh, in this particular outbreak, it had a case fatality ratio close to 90%. That got a lot of people's attention for the very obvious reason that it is a very that is a very lethal virus and also a very very nasty infection, which we'll talk a little more about, um, even for those who survive. At almost exactly the same time, in a, um, it actually started in a cotton factory in uh, Sudan, and then um, the, the original patients, the index cases, moved into a, um, a clinic for treatment, and interestingly enough, these are all resource poor settings, so this is now South Sudan, by the way, so in both of these cases, both of these situations, most of these numbers actually reflect uh, normal um, uninfected, un-Ebola infected people who were in the hospital for other things at the same time. Some of them were healthcare workers, many of them were just patients. And uh, in Sudan, we know that particular clinic had five sets of um, injection equipment. And obviously, there was no time to sterilize the injection equipment between patients 
And of course, they needed it to give all kinds of injections, take blood samples. Well, when you've got 300, a 300 bed clinic and you have uh, five sets of injection equipment, any bloodborne pathogen is, is obviously going to have a very good chance of, of uh, coming out and infecting other people who are there. Um, and that's exactly what happened in these two cases. The vast majority of the infections here were within the hospital setting. They were nosocomial. And that says something about the importance of health systems and infection control, a topic that will come up again and again. Since then, we've done somewhat better, at least in terms of uh, hospital-acquired infections by other patients or healthcare acquired infections by other patients is still an occupational hazard, as you know, for healthcare workers. So Sudan, interestingly enough, the other major strain or species of Ebola, uh, it's interesting they both sort of um, came to our attention at almost exactly the same time. Uh, this is a milder, you know, kind of gentler Ebola with only a, a 50 to 60 percent uh, case fatality rate. Still, I don't think I'd want to bet on, on, on that one. Um, since then, we've had roughly two dozen outbreaks altogether uh, of Ebola. We've discovered several new species, one that actually didn't, didn't um, cause any deaths, but did cause some illnesses in Cote d'Ivoire, very, very close to the area uh, we're talking about now, and I'll show you on the map in a few minutes how close that is, in 1994, came out of the Thai forest. These, these are typically associated, for reasons I'll explain in a few minutes, with forest and land, usually rural areas, and people going into the forest and, and catching it, and then spreading it to other close contacts, family members, and so on. This particular example was intensively studied and turns out to be one of the, well, we have very few cases, so with an N of one or two, we don't really know how virulent it is, but it seems to be somewhat uh, considerably less uh, lethal than, than the others. We can be grateful for that. And then we, we thought we understood, just as with most of these other infections, their geographic uh, range, we've seen fairly limited until this new one in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, there were outbreaks uh, from time to time in the usual places, basically in the same places they had originally occurred. Um, and then uh, that rule seems to have been broken around, um, Gabon is really within the same area, so uh, that was a slight extension of the range, but nothing particularly exciting. And then suddenly in 2000, Uganda had an outbreak for the first time. Now, Uganda has Marburg. Um, it's endemic to that area. And there are some caves there, uh, which, which uh, has to do with the fact that this is actually, these are probably natural infections. We know Marburg is of uh, certain bats. And so some of the caves that are heavily populated with bats, tourists go in and occasionally get Marburg. And there are other ways you can you can catch it also, just like Ebola. So in Uganda, where those caves are found, it's the Kitun caves, it's not a great surprise. But suddenly what, what everyone thought originally was Marburg in 2000 turned out to be the Sudan strain or Sudan species of uh, Ebola. And this was actually the largest outbreak we've had so far, with uh, over 400 cases. The other one that's particularly notable was the 1995 outbreak in Kikwit Zaire. Um, that was one of the larger ones with 315 cases. But it's also the one, those of you who know Laura Garrett or have followed her work, this is the one that she actually, that made her famous. She actually went to this outbreak, wrote, uh, wrote about it, and won the Pulitzer Prize for her reporting. Uh, I might mention that um, uh, her account of this from her book, Betrayal of Trust, uh, has been republished by Hachette for $2.95. You can get it uh, electronically. It's a Kindle book. Um, they finally um, made up their, their, their differences between Kindle and some of the, you know, 
Amazon and some of the publishers. But that's another story. So for 295, you can read an excerpt with a new introduction, she says, about uh, relating to the current situation. Um, the 1995 outbreak, a population of about 600,000 people, uh, roughly the population of what, Detroit, Milwaukee. Um, uh, it took almost six months for this outbreak to be recognized. Um, and at that point, there was a very rapid response, and it was controlled very rapidly. I make this contrast because one of the questions we have is why has the situation in these countries of West Africa become so out of control and been by far the largest outbreak we've ever seen? In fact, probably about five to six times larger than all of the previous outbreaks combined. And there are many reasons people have speculated about this. Delay and recognition was one of them. So I did want to make the comparison that even in Kikwi, which is a, not exactly an urban area, but is, is sort of not exactly rural either, you had a fairly high population density and you had considerable delay, which were often in recognition and response, which were often pointed to as the reasons that this particular outbreak now has gotten so out of control. So there may be more involved than that, which has to do with probably also human behavior uh, and, and other cities, which, which you've heard about and which I will come to. Um, equally notable, uh, there have been several Ebola outbreaks since then in places like Uganda and one that uh, actually occurred uh, a few years ago for the first time in northern Uganda with a species that had not been seen before uh, of, of Ebola. And so it was promptly named after, these tend to be named after places where they're first identified. Ebola is a river uh, in Zaire. Uh, near where the original outbreak was. And so this was called uh, Bundabugyo, uh, because it was uh, in that, um, that was the nearest town. Uh, this was so far uh, away, um, so, so remote in Uganda, that the roads had actually stopped some distance uh, before there, and the government wasn't even able to get up there until it had been going on for a while. Uh, I was not there personally, but I was in Uganda during this period when we had a very interesting situation of uh, Uganda having um, uh, several outbreaks with Sudan and Zaire strains, and Zaire having the Ugandan uh, Democratic Republic of Congo having the Uganda uh, strain of Bundabugyo at exactly the same time. So this um, was uh, something to confuse all of us who thought we could kind of put pins in the map and associate an infection with its uh, locale. So um, I, I caution you, you know, not to do that. But all of these, of course, have been dwarfed by the ongoing situation that, that we now see. Uh, just uh, for those who are um, in the epi department or aficionados of case definitions, the way we perceive when something like Ebola uh, first appears and we don't have laboratory tests, we didn't at that time, is to develop some kind of clinical case definition that um, can be used to, as a set of criteria, to identify the people who are most likely to be patients. And this was the original case definition, just for those who are curious, when Ebola first appeared as an unknown disease, uh, to Western medicine. I'm sure the Africans had experienced it many times before, but, but we didn't know that. In 1976, those were the case definitions. Eventually, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Fred Murphy was able to um, visualize the virus by electron microscopy, and then lab tests were developed, and so that third category of the confirmed case could now be added. But the 
probable and possible are based simply on clinical symptoms. And, and there's an art to writing these things, as I like to say. You have to make it broad enough that you catch everybody that you want to investigate, but not so broad that every malaria case, of which there are many more cases than Ebola in this area, will, will get picked up here. So some of the things that are included in this, this case definition include not only a headache, fever, and the usual things that you would expect to see with either malaria or even at the beginning with the flu, and uh, because it starts out very mildly, but also these other signs, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, uh, bleeding often in the form of bloody diarrhea. I'm sorry to say this during lunch, but this subject, this subject will come up several times because it's not one of the more elegant things they show in Hollywood movies about Ebola, but it's a fact that, that people who are lucky to talk about now we really have to because it's very important. Um, so these signs actually um, made it a little more likely that it's Ebola if you are in the area and might have had uh, contact uh, with someone who had similar signs or uh, died, which is not a very nice thought, uh, as opposed to the possibles who seem to have some of the signs and had no contact. In 2014, this is uh, from Medicine on Frontier, um, and this is the clinical case definition used in 2014. And I think basically it's, it's not fundamentally different, except we now have lab tests, um, including some very uh, good molecular methodology using the polymerase chain reaction, PCR, for uh, identifying the, the agent. Uh, the virus, and that's been particularly useful since 1976. Uh, it wasn't available then. Um, so I, I hate to say this is um, the guilty party, but in fact, these, these, uh, it, it's always amazing. So like most emerging infections, um, or most of what we call emerging infections, uh, Ebola and Marburg are what we would call zoonotic. That is to say, they're infections transmitted from other animals to humans in, in places where there's an opportunity for contact between these animals and people. And for these fruit bats, there are th three or four species that are thought to be um, possible natural hosts for these infections. And what that simply means is that when Ebola isn't infecting us or some other species, it is actually doing its thing as a natural infection of bats like these, where it seems to cause very little obvious harm. So um, one of my favorite quotes in this respect is uh, from Lewis Thomas. And if you've had the pleasure of reading Lewis Thomas's Lives with Sellers, other essays, they're very elegantly written and they're very enjoyable. So if you ever find time, I recommend them highly. But in one of his essays, he says that these uh, diseases like Ebola that are so devastating really represent an unfinished negotiation between the um, pathogen and the host over boundaries. So that negotiation over boundaries uh, in a natural reservoir or natural host, like the bat in the case of Ebola, other bats, and, and Marburg. We know Marburg is quite well established. Ebola is only still, we've tried everything else and we haven't found Ebola there. So unless it's in something really hard to uh, find, you know, like with the insects or the ticks or something like that, which people have suggested, and even try, then uh, this is the most likely um, natural host for Ebola as well as for Marburg and a number of others. Uh, those of you who saw the movie Contagion have seen a very similar fruit bat, and that's actually based on an outbreak of a totally unrelated virus called Nipah in NIPAH in Asia. Uh, it's somewhat fictionalized, of course. And what Hollywood loves to do 
is to make all of these things suddenly magically transform into viruses that can uh, transmit by the respiratory, by the flu. And luckily for us, we're all still here in part because viruses like Ebola do not transmit by the flu. And I, I really have to. At least not in the time course that Hollywood has provided, and not in the time course of human history uh, that we know of. So there's always the possibility that Ebola could be first, but I'm not putting any, uh, you know, real, I'm not betting my salary as small as it is um, on, on, on that possibility. Um, uh, however, you know, it's obviously something we will deal with if we have to. Right now, it's doing well enough, obviously by its very inefficient transmission. Uh, and, and we've done a lot, unfortunately, to help that along um, in, inadvertently. So this is not the culprit, perhaps, but the unwitting carrier or, uh, of, of this infection that, that doesn't seem to do much to be very happy with the animals roosting in the trees. And, um, um, obviously, um, excreting various things as well that probably contain a number of viruses, including Ebola or, or its relatives. And if you go into the forest, um, you will find these bats here. And the people typically who get Ebola in 1995, in Kiwi, for example, one of the largest and most famous Ebola outbreaks up till now, was, was a very simple story. It was a charcoal vendor who went into the forest to um, uh, collect wood and, and burn the wood to make charcoal. And somehow or another, he became infected. Rob obviously came back to his family. As he became sick, they took care of him. And they too became sick as a result of close contact with essentially infected secretions uh, and bodily fluids. You've seen this a lot in the news of the, the infected person. How did he get it? It may have been through, uh, so there are two possible routes, basically. Uh, either you pick up the virus um, from some bodily fluid that the uh, bat has left behind, or in some cases, um, through butchering or collecting either bats or certain other animals, chimpanzees, gorillas, some other non-human primates, and some types of antelopes as well as some other mammals, can become infected and just like us, die of Ebola. Uh, and when that happens and you find a fresh carcass and you're very hungry and have a lot of mouths to feed back home, it's a great temptation and it's happened with um, uh, a chimpanzee in Gabon, in fact, where someone found a dead chimpanzee, took it home, everybody partook of the feast. Unfortunately, that chimpanzee had died of Ebola, contracted in the forest, probably, and a number of the um, people who had the meal in that family also contracted Ebola. So those are basically the two ways you can get it. And ultimately, it's probably, we don't know for sure that this is actually the reservoir, but it's probably from some contact with that bag. That may or may not be good news, depending on your point of view. So this is a, a map that I'll just show you very briefly. This is, uh, uh, it, it's, it's actually interesting for a number of reasons. But this shows known outbreaks of Ebola. Um, places where Ebola outbreaks have occurred in Africa. Dotted lines are actually the host range of the various species of uh, fruit bats belonging to one particular family, the major family of fruit bats, that are thought to be the natural hosts of Ebola, as well as uh, down in this area, 
uh, meat dye, uh, totally unrelated virus um, that, that, however, makes good meat is also just as vulnerable, right? Contagion. Uh, and um, this range is a very large range, so you could very well ask the question, you know, why don't we see Ebola in some of these other places? And we don't have a very good answer to that question. You know, why not in, in Northern Australia? In, well, the, the, arguably it might be in the Philippines. There's a, a Dustin strain that was very famously written about by Richard Preston in a book called The Hot Zone. So some people like to call it Ebola Preston. Uh, it kills monkeys, probably, but apparently not humans. And it was found in uh, pigs in the Philippines. Um, and uh, how, how it got there is another question that's still uncertain. Uh, so it may well be that, that some of these bats have various related viruses and do, in fact, uh, deposit or leave them in these areas, but we just haven't discovered them. But you can see that this range includes also much of Africa. So it shouldn't really be a great surprise to us when it pops up in other parts of Africa, simply that we haven't, where we haven't recognized the disease before. And I'm going to come back to that point because sometimes people think, you know, that this has just moved into West Africa. And in fact, that isn't what, what happened. So before I do that, let me say a few words. I told you something about the ecology um, and, and the history of this disease. Let me say a few words about what it's like to have Ebola. It's head. In the beginning, it starts out like everything else. It's a flu-like illness, basically. Begins suddenly, you're feeling well one day, and then the next day, suddenly, just like the flu, something's hit you. Um, and I, I, I hope not Ebola. And, um, but not very likely unless you have happened to go and come in contact with them and physically uh, sick Ebola patients. So it starts out basically as a flu-like illness. What might uh, often be seen as well, that an astute clinician, a very astute clinician, could pick up on is abdominal pain and other types of essentially abdominal uh, signs and symptoms. Vomiting sometimes happens, diarrhea, often bloody, and oddly enough, hiccups, which um, uh, I, I wondered about the first time I read this, and I've asked a number of people, and it is true, you can actually document people get hiccups. Well, you can get hiccups without having colds. So don't worry about it <laughs> the next time you have hiccups. But if you have all these other symptoms and you have hiccups, then, then worry, you know. <laughs> then, you know, uh, I would seek care immediately. And later on, basically, this is like um, any other shock syndrome. What happens is that it progresses very rapidly in a matter of a few days, unfortunately. Uh, the abdominal um, signs become much more pronounced. Uh, excuse me for mentioning this again. I hope you've all finished lunch. So I um, but uh, bloody diarrhea, and in fact, diarrhea in general, is a very uh, characteristic part of this disease. This was not recognized until recently. And in fact, diarrhea is so profuse that one of the major problems is dehydration. And one of the major changes in our treatment in recent years, in recent months, uh, with these current, uh, this current outbreak, is to give fluid replacement the same way you would for cholera. I see a colleague from, from originally from Bangladesh who spends a lot of time in Bangladesh and knows exactly what I'm speaking about, I think, right? So uh, welcome to everyone. And uh, uh, cholera is, is um, a disease where if you give very good fluid replacement, you can get a pretty good survival rate. Unlike Ebola, it's just basically a diarrheal disease that involves mostly you know, the gastrointestinal problems. Ebola, that's one of many things. And of course, we hear a lot about bleeding. So um, Hollywood loves to show all of this you know, kind of dramatic, people bleeding from every imaginable place, 
you know, including places you didn't even know you could bleed from. Um, let me not reassure you, but tell you that uh, that is true about 40% of the time. So you can see bloodshot eyes in many patients. You can see some bleeding from the nose and mouth sometimes. But very often bleeding is internal, and then uh, bloody diarrhea is far more common than, than all of what Hollywood would show. But Hollywood obviously doesn't want to show you some of the, the less photogenic parts of it, do they? I mean, I, maybe they do, but it's a different kind of movie. You know, be a different sort of film. So, uh, so what happens in this situation, of course, is that the virus attacks most of the organs, um, causes a lot of cell damage, but also particularly attacks the line, the cells that line the blood vessels. And so you get a lot of leakiness in blood vessels, a lot of internal bleeding, uh, often in the abdomen, and a lot of failure. To, to have delivery of blood to other organs, which often results in multi-organ failure, either kidney failure, liver failure, respiratory failure, just the whole thing goes at once. Uh, and, and that's very much like the kind of shock situation you see in children with septic shock from severe bacterial disease. They all have the same final common uh, pathway. They all basically converge on the same reasons and the same kinds of mechanisms. So um, in the end, uh, you know, Ebola is a very unpleasant uh, disease, but in, in the end, it's like any other severe shock. It's the uh, fluid loss, the abnormalities in, in, in blood flow and blood clotting, and the um, loss of blood pressure and blood supply that, that eventually gets the, the patient if they aren't going to survive. The, the lucky ones, of course, you know, anywhere from 10 to 60 percent, depending on circumstances, probably host factors, some other things we don't know about, um, virus strain, will uh, uh, go through all of this and then at some point start to get better. It's really amazing. And it does take a while. Craig Spencer, one of our very own, who's in very famous in the Bellevue Hospital, which was very well prepared uh, for it. Uh, Craig Spencer um, is still feeling a little under the weather, uh, but he's, uh, you know, he's recovered from Ebola, and even near the end of his hospitalization, he was talking about, you know, he's getting so bored, he asked for his banjo. He saw all those newspapers, all those newspaper stories. So you really, it's really amazing, almost like the it takes a while to fully recover, but uh, those who recover really do usually recover remarkably. Considering what this does to your body, I mean, this is worse than being in an auto accident. It's really amazing to me, you know, how quickly most people actually manage to recover um, uh, if they do, <laughs> and that's the, the big if. Okay, so um, you do need um, laboratory confirmation to be sure somebody has. Ebola, but if everybody in your neighborhood has it and you've just been with a lot of Ebola patients at, at a funeral, taking care of them, something like that, then it's probably a pretty good guess that you know, that's probably not what it is. Uh, if you get worse rather than better, then, then, then it's always no. Okay, so that's the encouraging part. How is Ebola transmitted? This is very important only because there is so much supposition about this, you know, and um, normally, I wouldn't take your time with this, but uh, we saw someone come back from um, from working with Medicines on Frontier, Craig Spencer, and we saw the spectacle, I think, of politicians trying to act like politicians during just before an election. So Rahm Emanuel used to say he was. Uh, once Chief of Staff or President Obama, for those who remember that far back, the last year or two, and is now mayor of Chicago. And he used to say, I have to clean up his language a little bit, but uh, he used to say, never let a good crisis go to waste. I think the lesson from this is never have a crisis just before an election, because you know the politicians are going to do 
things that are reassuring, we think, but not scientifically um, valid, and in many cases, offering false reassurance. Uh, so anyway, that's my editorial for today, uh, and I'll leave it at that. Yeah, but Ebola is spread through direct, this is from the World Health Organization. We have known this for 40 years. I mean, this is not a new virus. We have had two dozen of these outbreaks since 1976. So it's no secret. There is no news about this. The only news is that, you know, um, people, human behavior has not changed either. So the only way that we know of the people actually get infected is through direct contact with infected bodily fluids. Um, all these indelicate words, stool, vomit, blood, somewhat less in, in urine saliva. Semen is interesting. Um, recovered patients, who of course in this case have to be male, can actually um, transmit the virus for up to seven weeks in this um, uh, in, in, uh, through um, sort of so you give them the same advice when they recover or you know, when you release them that you would give to an HIV um, a person with HIV infection you know, be, be careful because it can be sexually transmitted one of the very few uh, examples because when people have Ebola they have no interest in any such thing breast milk also turns out to have virus in it for some of the longer periods so you do have to be careful but it really has to be direct contact with any of these, uh, or some of these fluids. Sweat, not so much, even though it's always talked about, it turns out. Um, with someone who has a clinical illness, which means they have enough virus in the body that these fluids actually are infected. And it turns out that after death, the, um, the, the body becomes somewhat more infectious, even on the surface. So, yeah. This is why you see more burial, at burial services, funeral preparation, where people wash the body, may uh, embrace it, and so on, and why you see the uh, infection is often passed that way. And you've seen it here as well, uh, because uh, for, a short, for a while after death, people, it's an unpleasant subject, I'm sorry, but the whole subject is unpleasant. Um, you know, people do become somewhat more infectious, and it's easier uh, if you come in contact even with the skin there. Normally, you do not be at much risk, but here you are. The skin of the person has just died. You can also have contact with contaminated uh, surfaces that, or, or other things that, that have been contaminated by body fluid of an infected person. So one of the commonest thing, one of the commonest things that healthcare workers who may get infected often do is is they have gloves and, and uh, that may have blood uh, from their obviously working with patients and they may accidentally rub their noses or, or nose or eyes before they have taken their gloves off and fully decontaminated themselves. That is has been recorded a number of times. And it's, Understandable why, because the, the personal protective equipment I'll show you picture is very important. This is just a, a fairly simple map uh, showing the area of West Africa that we're talking about. This area has never before experienced um, an outbreak of Ebola that um, we have known about. However, there is very good evidence based on some studies of samples in Sierra Leone um, that uh, at least 10 years ago, there were cases of Ebola that accounted for about 8% of the unknown, we call them viral hemorrhagic fevers, that uh, were not diagnosed at the time. They never quite made it to this kind of outbreak. Don't ask me why. They were isolated cases that Clinicians obviously knew about it because they sent in blood samples to be tested, and they, some 8% of them, 2006 to 2008, when they were retested recently, were positive for um, about 8% of 200 samples were positive for Ebola. 
And these were individuals who were clinically sick or they wouldn't have had samples sent in. This never became a major outbreak. Interesting story. We don't know anything else about that. Um, but it turns out that this area is endemic for another viral hemorrhagic fever. You know, what viral means hemorrhagic simply means with obviously um, bleeding or abnormalities of blood vessels, fever. So, you know, it, they used to refer to all of these as hemorrhagic fevers, a totally unrelated virus that, however, is carried by rodents called Lassa fever. And Lassa fever is very famous because it was actually the inspiration for the Andromeda strain. Everyone thinks he's vulnerable. But those of you who know the Andromeda strain, maybe I'm just showing my age, by Michael Crichton, he later went on to do bigger things like Jurassic Park. But he was inspired by, in fact, the, this outbreak, which we had not seen before, in the Africans had, in 1969, that, that virtually wiped out a mission hospital in Nigeria. And it was called loss of fever after the the area, and by the way, one of the patients, a nurse, was, was medevaced over here to Columbia, uh, which is interesting when you consider you know, how afraid we are of all these things today. She survived. Uh, she died about three years ago of natural causes at a reasonable um, age, and none of the people who took care of her got sick. So go, go figure. But it wasn't Ebola. However, because of that, this hospital in Kenema had been set up as a national laboratory and national loss of fever uh, center. And later, Ebola patients came in and became rather notorious, I, I guess. Uh, but they, that was actually where they got the samples to test. We also know from some very famous genetic uh, molecular evidence, which I, 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 I think is less compelling, published in science, the evidence is very good, just the dating is very hard to get right, uh, that, that it's at least 10 years, that this virus, which is basically Zaire um, Ebola, has been in this, this region for, at least in Sierra Leone, probably the whole region, for at least 10 years. I would bet much longer. So it's not new, it's just we hadn't known it before. Now, what are some of the key features, and I'll be brief for the next few minutes, uh, of this outbreak in, in West Africa. Um, well, the most unusual thing is the size and scope. It, it is the largest outbreak by far, I'll show you some numbers. It involves, it's the only one that I know of that actually involves more than one country with the same infection. Uh, and its size is, is unbelievable, actually. Um, I'll get back to that in minutes, don't worry. Here are some figures. Uh, as of now, that is as of two days ago, the uh, official figure uh, is 15,000 known cases. Those are the known cases. There are probably at least as many, probably twice as many we don't know at home, not trusting the hospitals, not trusting, and, and you know, it's better now than it was in 1976 when this was a good place to get infected, uh, if you weren't already. Uh, but you know now I think the hospitals are, despite problems they may have, you know they're uh, much much better in terms of nosocomial infection for other patients. Uh, nevertheless, there are a lot of people who mistrust uh, medical uh, facilities and stay home, and we don't have any way of counting them at this point. Be something for all of us to do, you know, after things have calmed down. But we know 15,000 cases with over 5,000 deaths. Now, while all this is going on, there's a, another outbreak of Ebola, which is a footnote, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It's classic Ebola Zaire, which pretty much this is too, but slightly different strain. So, but they're quite similar. And this would have gotten the front pages of the newspaper or a uh, Huffington Post or something for a day or two, the daily piece, for a day or two. Uh, 70 cases with 42 deaths in exactly the same place almost as the Ebola outbreak in 1976. 
1,776. And we've gotten so blasé about this in the face of 15,000 cases that we, this is a footnote, um, but it's under control, you'll be glad to know, unlike this one, which continues to spread. So it's been Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, um, someone brought it from, um, from Liberia to Nigeria by getting on a plane and infecting a few people, not on the plane, but once he landed, which is a very interesting thing. We don't have any infections of plane passengers who flew uh, on the same plane as someone who was on. But however, once they get on the ground, you know, when people uh, get closer, uh, it's, it's a, a more of an issue. And this person was sick when he left, he was sick when he arrived, and they, someone should have noticed that. But anyway, that was uh, eventually controlled. Um, in the meantime, Mali has a number of cases, now five deaths, uh, from two probably unrelated events. And uh, everyone's obviously worried that more might be involved. So, so it's definitely increasing. This map shows you uh, the num a number of the places, and the circles tell you something about the number of, uh, of cases in the last few weeks. Total cases by the shading. And you can see that this um, coastal area of uh, West Africa is affected. Mali, unfortunately, we hope it will get control soon. But uh, right now, you know, they are uh, beginning to experience an outbreak. And here's Cote d'Ivoire, which I told you about earlier, uh, in neighboring these areas. Now, where it all started was, was down here in an area of Guinea that was probably fairly uh, rural and fairly like most Ebola places, fairly rural, forested, not very high population density. Unfortunately, it happened for us, it happened to be on the border of uh, two other countries, um, Liberia and Sierra Leone, where the road system is somewhat better and people tend to go to the capitals. This is the capital of um, Freetown, the, the capital of uh, Sierra Leone, and uh, down here, this is around the capital of um, Monrovia, the capital of Liberia. So this is the capital of Guinea, and you can see it's much shorter route, despite the way the maps are drawn, it's a lot easier to get to the major cities here than, than here, although some did. So people went across these borders, which uh, essentially are legal fictions. If you've seen pictures of them, they're like strings across the road. You know, and if we can't, you know, I mean, everyone says, let's seal off the borders, our borders, their borders. Well, it hasn't worked with, with drug trade. I don't think you know, here it's even harder because the people have families on both sides just like many other parts of the world, you know, where the borders for convenience is drawn by European colonial powers, um, not, not by the people themselves who you know, don't, don't uh, necessarily settle neatly into one country or another. Uh, as a result of, of this, it was uh, several weeks before, and probably actually several months. We think the first case occurred sometime in November, December of last year and then was reported um, in March. And the reasons for that are not clear, but the very first report from the World Health Organization, uh, to the public anyway, to the world, was on the 23rd of March. And it st starts very dryly, this year, starts very dryly saying, the government of Guinea has informed us that as of the 22nd of March, there were 49 cases of Ebola in this, in this region. Um, now, you know when you already have 49 cases, this did not happen yesterday. With SARS, um, when the Chinese government first admitted uh, having this, uh, there were 305 cases before the Hong Kong incident that spread around the world. So these don't happen overnight, and in fact, we think it had been going <coughs> on at a lower level since um, November or December. Uh, so for at least three or four months. Unfortunately, also, as people moved across here for various reasons, uh, it spread throughout this area. Um, 
I'd like to say a few words about health systems, because after all, this is about health systems. And there's a central role for health systems. These countries are all fragile states. They have had civil disruption. They have just restored some, some central control, some government power uh, that is still weak in many cases. And uh, they've all had civil wars. Mali has had similar civil disruptions, which is why I, I worry when I see that you know, we now have cases there. Uh, these are all places that, although now you can say this about almost any war, that where the governments are not trusted anymore. But, but then again, you know, I kind of think about the United States in this respect. So maybe that doesn't make life very well. You know, these other countries you need. Nevertheless, the governments are not trusted, so it's very hard for them to, to actually you know, get out there and do something useful for them. Um, in addition, or to have good communications, in addition, the uh, public health and healthcare systems are very badly damaged as a result of years of, of civil strife and, um, frankly, very little human capacity, very few people uh, to, to take care of these places. The result of this is, is that you really don't have a public health infrastructure to speak of. You have a very fragmented healthcare system. In all these places, the big cities have hospitals, the districts have clinics, but you know they, they vary quite a lot in their quality and ability to take care of people. And the human uh, element is often very lacking. And these are probably among the things, in addition to the delayed recognition, that help this epidemic to go out of control. One of the the con one of the, the um, Consequences of this is what Joanne Liu, the uh, international president of, of Medicines on Frontier, refers to as the, um, the crisis within the crisis, or the emergency within the emergency, which is that something we all learn in emergency preparedness. If you um, have an emergency, you also still have to be able to carry out your normal essential functions. And they can. They simply do not have the capacity to do both things at the same time. And that is a serious problem. It's hard in this country, but you can see a place like Bellevue can do that. It's big. Uh, and a lot of resources have been um, put in to make sure that happens. Not every place is that fortunate. And so as, as a hospital like JFK Hospital in Monrovia becomes converted to an Ebola treatment center, the pregnant women, the people with heart failure, the people in auto accidents have no place to go. Or if they do, they, they have the risk of uh, coming in contact with Ebola, and so they won't go. Uh, but in most cases, there simply is no place to go. So this is a reason why health systems really aren't important to you. And in fact, what you see, this comes from the sense of frontier, is the investment in health systems and the number of health workers uh, higher in France than almost any place in the world. Actually, they really have a lot of doctors there. Um, uh, high in the United States, as you can see. Look at those figures for the three countries that have are the epicenter of this epidemic. You know, even Nigeria, the biggest country, the most populated country in all of Africa, with over 150 million people, has only 70 thousand physicians at the time 16,000 of them were on strike but that's a nice story. so you know that's the biggest country there and they only have 17,000 physicians from all the country so not counting foreign or as we now call them international um, volunteers like like Craig Spencer and the others you have obviously very very few people to carry out the necessary work so health systems really are important, and the breakdown of the health system led to a number of consequences, not just disease, but also capital flight, people running away, and uh, heavy economic consequences. Another thing that public health and health systems do, and I need to tell you, is something called contact tracing. 
And this is very important with Ebola because it is a disease that can be spread by direct contact. It is spread basically by someone uh, touching uh, through broken skin or getting onto a mucous membrane some infected bodily fluid of uh, an Ebola patient, someone who has enough virus that they're probably already symptomatic. Anyway, they're not likely to be bleeding, throwing up, or whatever until, you know, we call that symptomatic. And at that point, you, you would want them, obviously, to be um, uh, protected and put into isolation so they can be taken care of and also not um, infect other people. But very often, you know, we still check up to find out who else might have come in contact with these people. Especially, think of that first patient, uh, Thomas Duncan in Dallas, and he was turned away. You know, he was seen at an emergency department. They didn't think it was anything serious. He went back a few days later, highly symptomatic. And at that point, they decided maybe it was Ebola, and they put him into isolation. Uh, I, I won't, I won't hit Dallas too hard. They were the first. They, they didn't do a very good job. In fact. Poor job. He died. The only people who became infected, interestingly enough, were his health care, were two nurses who had probably not been given sufficient training in, in the um, proper protective equipment. I'll show you what that looks like when it's done in Africa and uh, in, in precautions. They were young and they wanted to do it. They meant well, but nobody had properly trained them. And it's even for trained people. This is not easy to do. It's very easy to make a mistake, especially when you're taking it off, as I said, accidentally left your eye with the nose. That's, you know, that, that's enough if you're unlucky. Uh, the people, uh, his fiance and others, in the apartment where he stayed several days after he began to develop symptoms, never became infected. The 90 contacts who had to be traced while he was around in, in Dallas, never became infected. But they had to be traced. So that's a big job for public health to find all of these, these people and find out what, in fact, they did. And to follow them for what we consider to be the maximum incubation period, 21 days, so that after, you know, we know that they're not going to get sick. Contact tracing identified what we think was the index case, the first patient in uh, Wikipedia, um, Guinea, that started this whole chain reaction. And you can see the many contacts that, that this led to. Uh, a two-year-old boy, as, as an index case, strikes me as odd. Um, maybe he was playing in the farmers, I don't know. But I, I suspect there's probably another earlier case that hasn't been but I'm going to be speculating. This is as far back as the chain has been traced. You can see how quickly that, that, that chain really does go through a chain reaction and moves because of the funeral into Sierra Leone very quickly um, and, and into Liberia. Uh, and it's interesting that when we talk about PPE, physical protective equipment, and I'll finish up very quickly, uh, Medicines on Frontier, which is extremely cautious, they've only had three people that I know of from uh, volunteers from abroad become infected. Craig Spencer, which was uh, one of only two or three, was the dispute in that number, working for MSF who became infected. Uh, so they're very, very careful. They've had very few mistakes. This is how they send people out to do contact tracing. They don't wear, because you don't want to be interviewed while someone's wearing this thing makes you look like a, a space alien or an astronaut, you know. So they go out in normal um, street clothes. They stand about six feet away from the um, contact. Who may be sick or may not be sick. Most cases it's not, but some of them are. Some of them are developing or have already developed people. And they, they interview them, uh, find out who they've been in contact with, whether they're feeling well, and so on. And not a single one of these people has become sick. So, you know, Ebola, if you're 
unlucky or careless, it can become, especially by, you know, you can get, especially healthcare workers' occupation. That's where health systems are really important. But it's not actually, you know, like um, the Andromeda strain or like the flu, it just does not spread in quite the same way, or quite the same degree, despite which you may have. Very briefly, this is an Ebola treatment center set up by Medicine Sense on Frontier, so as not to uh, put them in contact with others uh, who are not infected. They have these areas separated, and that also prevents uh, using up hospital beds. It also allows family to come and visit. They can stand on the, uh, on the outside by a fence and actually see their own relatives. This is the personal protective equipment that the uh, people who work who are taking care of these uh, patients. And it's exactly like what they're doing. Well, if you can recall, they have some effects here, but at the, uh, substitutes for masks that are much more comfortable for masks and goggles that are much more comfortable than cost a lot of money. So we can't afford them in Africa. Um, and basically, dressing like that allows them to have Patient. Not too pleasant for the patient, but that patient is, is already, I mean, he probably thinks he's a loser. <laughs> so uh, when you go in, there, there are a lot of uh, rituals, uh, decontamination, and when you leave, there are similar rituals. So Ebola is one of many zoonoses, and I called them original infection some years ago, and they come from nature. We just do things that allow them. This is the global aviation network, just to symbolize the fact that these infections can, in fact, travel further both locally as HIV has, and around the world. Yeah, occasionally, people in the global which we thought very far away, could do that. I think it really stresses the importance of health systems, of having global public health and healthcare systems that are effective, because the problem is not people coming here people in West Africa who are not only suffering, but as Tom Frieden, the director of CDC and our former New York City Health Commissioner says, you know, it can't be controlled until it's stopped at the source. Because the imported cases we're worrying about here are simply um, coming from that original source and they're simply, you know, the, the occasional traveler or the occasional victim, um, healthcare worker who has been working there, and that's where they got it. It is not a natural infection here, and I don't think it ever will be. So I've taken a little more time than I had planned, and I appreciate your patience, but I am available for any questions on any subject, if it is on the wrong to something. So, thank you for your time. So um, kind of going back to the emergency within the emergency, um, if we're so focused on getting the disease kind of controlled, how do we kind of help the governments prepare plans to keep this control continuing so something like this doesn't happen of the same caliber or happen again? That's an excellent question because unfortunately it has been a, an ongoing problem I mean, if these people, thank you, I'm going to take advantage of, of the lunch you very kindly provided. So forgive me if I talk while I'm eating. I know it's important. But um, we, um, if they had had effective public health and primary health care systems in the first place, you know, this might not, oh, thank you. You know, this might not have become the problem it became. And every time we have a crisis, we like to solve the crisis, we like to forget that there is a problem. So one of the really important issues is to think about the larger lesson. This is really a problem of healthcare system, public health, it's a global problem. And you know, if if we think we are worried about Ebola here, you know, we really need to, as Tom Friedman says, control it there. And that means it's a global problem. And it's going to be very hard. I mean, we have politicians 
not to be too critical and not to be too political, but you know, who very publicly said, that, and, and we have um, very strict travel regulations here at the university in place, you know, that very publicly said, you know, let, let's, um, it, there were people who called for closing off the borders entirely, for not letting anyone in from any of these countries. Um, they would find somewhere else to go. Most of them were changing plans in Europe anyway. It's very hard to get directly to Africa nowadays. You know, so many of them would probably slip through, but of course, you know, they would not tell you that they might have come from a place that had Ebola. So you don't, really don't want to do what seems to be the obvious solution. What you need to do, I think, personally, is to invest in the kind of health system that's going to protect everybody. And that's been very hard because we haven't seen it done. WHO has promised since its inception that it would develop global public health and primary health care for all. And people keep asking me, have they done it yet? So they keep assuming it's going to be done. So that's a very important question. I think what it means is that we all really have to be advocates for it and do what we can to encourage the people who are in power, who like easy solutions, to do what is sometimes a harder solution, but one that will pay off better in the long run. Um, I don't think, uh, I don't Well, so the best data we have, of course, comes from more controllable systems yeah. like animal models. And there we can, you know, actually determine mortality and cause of mortality. In most cases, Ebola virus disease, as they now call it, EVD, has been renamed, used to be called Ebola hemorrhagic fever, in part because it is a complex disease. Not only does it involve multi-organ failures, and, and you know, a lot of circulatory and um, electrolyte balance problems, but there are often secondary infections by um, bacteria, perhaps by other viruses, we don't know, and we don't know what contribution that makes to mortality. What they do here, um, and what they do in Africa with Médecins Sans Frontières, is if they think there's a bacterial infection, they will treat that with antibiotics. That can be treated even though we're only working on experimental therapeutics right now for Ebola. So we don't really know. Ultimately, we ascribe these deaths to Ebola, but it's really more complex than that. There are many different ways in which people die of it. So that doesn't answer your question, I know, but. Yeah. This is really broad, but how do you think this will shape our response to epidemics going forward, like both here in the US and abroad? Like, what do you think we'll learn from all of this? I hope we will learn something. I hope we will, you know, not simply sort of finally consider this a problem that occurred in some poor countries that is now under control and move on from there. So my hope is that, and I, I'm, if I sound a little less than optimistic, I used to be much more optimistic. <laughs> You know, but having lived through a few of these makes you feel, you know, that it's more hopeful than anything. My hope is that it will um, encourage people to realize that we do need broader systems, not just an anti-Ebola system, not just solving one crisis and putting out one fire, but a fire department and a series of fire alarms. You know, and um, I'm hoping we'll get there, but I think it will require you know, all of you, you know, advocating for this, because frankly, you know, we've, we've all been shouting as loud as we can, and I'm not sure, even the media, you know, has, has, has tried to be responsible about it. And I'm not sure the message is, is getting through, so I'm hopeful the message will, will get through, but I think, you know, we need to remember it's not going to happen unless we, we remind people. And that's why we're all here, right? That's why you're here. So thank you for being here. We have time for one more question. Oh, sure. I think we actually have time for two more if I'm good. <laughs> Maybe even three. There are more. Oh, it's not like it's not a big thing. It's just a question. Um, I'm not sure if you're 
in textbook settings, but like in terms of like if that to be sort of events, we're going to talk about using, I guess, Twitter data or like mobile phone data and things like that. So, do you think it could actually be able to? I think I'll have to zoom a little closer. I'm actually getting old, so. Well, no, it's an excellent question. I think the technologies for reporting are, are much better than they were, even when we started from that mail 20 years ago. It, it is literally 20 years, this uh, August of 1994, uh, when it started, and we just had a little celebration, if you will. But um, if that's the word, because the diseases are still there. So I'm hopeful that, that you know, better early reporting. At that time, the internet wasn't even the world. Yeah, hard to believe. Email is an almost impossible task. Um, now we have mobile phones, you know, not everyone has a smartphone in Africa, but every place I've been in Uganda, somebody has a mobile phone. So, you know, reporting through that, through those mechanisms, and then some of the electrical tools and other tools we have, you know, even just for, for clinical identification without a laboratory through um, you know, simple communications, I think really offers a lot of opportunities for the future if we can find ways to utilize them. I'm hopeful that that's going to happen. There's a lot of interest in and health, as they call it. You know, so I'm, I'm excited about that possibility because I think it will allow us to get better at early morning. But then it all depends on what we do with that information. And I think that's where the biggest gap is. In the past, we didn't have the information. We're getting more of it now. We have to be responsible and, and take charge of doing something like that, which is where I think we, we've seen the real potential. And I'm hopeful. Thank you, Thank you all for your time. It's a very, very